Very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having me here tonight. Thank you for MES, CIAS, as well as uh, NTU for inviting me as a speaker. I guess as the last speaker for this evening, I have the privilege of talking about probably the easiest and most lighthearted subject um, for tonight, and that is why you should be investing while you're young and what are the sound of the benefits of doing so. Now, a little bit of background about myself. I work for a company, an asset management company called Henderson Global Investors. It's a UK-based asset management company. Um, and part of my job involves me talking to investors, talking to bankers, talking to insurance agents, talking to financial advisors on a daily basis, talking to them about financial products. But one of the things that, that has often sort of been surprising to me is how skeptical people have been uh, towards putting their money to work, towards putting their money in investment products. And these are the three top comments that I often receive. First thing people say is that, well, oh, sorry, these are the top three concerns that people have about investing. First thing people say is, that, well, I only need to think about investing where I want to retire. I'm young at this point in time. My job is more important. I don't need to invest. Second thing that they say, it's too difficult, risky, time consuming. I'm not involved in finance. I don't like finance. I hate numbers. That's why I don't invest. The third thing that people say is that you need investing is for the rich. You need to have a lot of money before you invest. Well, I'm here to you before tonight to tell you that all these things aren't necessarily true. In fact, you need to plan ahead. By the time you want to retire and start to think of investing, it's going to be too late. And I shall give you an illustration later in my presentation. The second thing to note is that investing is not as difficult as you, you think it is. Once you understand some simple, basic concepts, you can apply this throughout your investment career. The third thing is that you, can, it doesn't need a lot, you don't need a lot of money to invest, as, as Mr. Chan has uh, mentioned earlier on. You can invest with as little as $100 a month, whether you go on what we call a monthly investment plan or a regular savings plan. You can put your money to work for as little as $100 a month. If you're buying a Singapore savings bond or a Singapore government securities bond, you can put your money to work for as little as $500 on a lump sum payment. So there are four key reasons why you should invest and shall cover them very briefly. The first thing is that we all need to keep up with the cost of living, rising inflation. Now, Mr. Mr. Francis Tan had some, had some slides about talking about the Singapore budget. One of those things in the Singapore budget that we've come out that you have noticed, we followed it earlier this week, is that water prices are going to go up by 30% over the next two years. But if you think about it, over the course of the last 20 years, it's not just water prices we have, well, will be going up, but it's Everything that we've bought, whether we've purchased, majority of items that you purchase. On this slide here, what I try to show you is that these are the prices of some sample grocery items in the supermarket and how prices have gone up over the last 20 years. You can see that the price of bread, one loaf of bread has gone up by 74%. Eggs have gone up by 37%. Bananas cost more, cost 74% more than they used to 20 years ago, so on and so forth. So clearly, we need to invest in order to keep up with inflation. Now at this point, some of you out there might say, well, I already put my money in the banks. Isn't that good enough as a form of investment? Well, that's only true if the bank is giving you a reasonable rate of return. And what I show you on this chart here, uh, and one of my colleagues just pulled this out a couple of days ago, is the average deposit rate that you're getting from these six banks out here. Uh, and we pulled this from, from, from the website of these couple of banks here. And the average interest rate that you can see here if you deposit a minimum of $50,000, we're talking about a fixed deposit here, and you keep it locked in for 12 months, you're only getting 0.26%. Just how much is 0.26%? Well, if you put in $10,000, this means you're only getting $260 back, sorry, $26 uh, back uh, in return for that. So that's how low it is. The second reason of why you need to invest is to plan for your future. Now, I just want to take a sort of a, a poll here. How many of you in the audience know what the concept of five C's in Singapore stands for? And this was sort of a, quite a popular concept in the, in the 90s. It represented sort of the, the Singaporean's uh, dream, if you, if you can call it that. What, 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 are, what are some of the five C's? Can, can anyone mention that? Condominium, that's, that's correct. You've got condominium, you've got cash, you've got credit card, you've got country club. And you've got, what's the last one? Car. That's right. So those are the five Cs uh, of the 90s that were very popular. And you know, every, almost every graduate there aspired to, to achieve these five Cs. And that sort of represented success uh, back then. But things have probably changed a lot since then. And probably those things aren't relevant to you now. But these things here on this slide, 
these are things that are going to be relevant, very relevant to you in the next couple of years very, very soon. Some of you out there, you're planning to get married, you want to buy a car, you want to buy a house, you want to start a family, you want to support your parents. Relying on your salaries alone isn't going to be enough. You need to invest. So that's the second point. Third point to note about why you should invest is that you get to benefit from experience much earlier on. I'll give you an example here. Investing is kind of like, I would say, it's kind of like riding a learning to ride a bicycle. It's a useful skill set to have. Now, when you start to ride a bicycle, you've got to go through some bumpy roads. You go through a smooth road, you get a momentum up, you, get a, you have to pedal harder when you go uphill, you gain momentum when you go downhill. You may fall down, but you learn to pick, uh, you learn to pick yourself up. Investing in many ways is similar to that. You go through bumpy roads, you go through cycles, you go through various humps, you may get hurt financially, but you learn to pick yourself up and you get back into the game. On this slide here, what I try to show you is the performance or the returns, the movement of global stock markets over the last 20 years. And we look at this uh, at an index called MSCI World. And what I tried to do is map out the key market events that have took place over this period of time. But well, one thing you can see clearly from here is things move in cycles, right? And the sooner they start, the more you start to develop a sense of understanding of financial markets, not just financial markets, by the way, but you gain an understanding of yourself, the, 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 how you behave, how you react to certain market events. And over time, you gain, the more experience you gain, the more you are able to develop your own investment style. And that will help you, uh, they, that will help you make more informed decisions. You won't panic as, you, as per what you, you may have when you first start investing, and it will benefit you longer term. So that's the third reason why you should invest. The fourth reason why you should invest comes to this, which is probably the most important one, and that is to benefit from the power of compounding. So the example that I like to use here is, is one that's you know, probably weighing on your minds, is that how do you make $1 million uh, in your lifetime? So the average age that I think of male graduates in Singapore is around about 25 years old, ladies will probably start uh, entering the workforce a little earlier than that. And how do you make $1 million by the time you're 65? All you need to do, what this chart tries to say, is that all you need to do is set aside $655 a month. Now, I read from uh, the Ministry of Manpower statistics that the average monthly starting salary of a fresh graduate in Singapore, and I think this was one last year, is about $3,154. $655 is barely just 20% of your monthly salary. I think that's something that's quite achievable. Now, assuming that you said that you managed to set aside $655 a month, and assuming that you can get a return of 5% per year, you would reach that $1 million by the time you're 65. Doesn't sound too difficult, right? But the other thing about it, the beauty about this, is that out of that $1 million, you would have only put in, your capital that you put in, your accumulation of your $655 over the years, is only about one third of that amount two-thirds of your return would have actually come from the reinvestment, the compounding interest that you get, the compounding returns that you get from that accumulated amount over the years. So that's the power of compounding. The other thing to know about this chart is that if you don't start at 25 years old, you say, okay, you, know, you want to take your time, you want to wait things out, and you start when you're 35 years old, the $655 that you have to set aside per month almost goes to doubles to about $1,200 a month that you have to set aside. And worse still, if you don't start at 35 and you start later on at 45 years old, that amount compared to when you're 25 almost jumps up four times to, that you have to set aside $2,400 a month in order to reach that $1 million target by the time you're 65. So this is the most important thing. So I've touched about the reasons of why you should invest. Now let me touch on the reason, how you can invest. And first and foremost, you have to make a differentiation between investing and speculating. And it comes down to this, the amount of risk you take, the basis for your decision, and your time horizon. If those of you who are, who are quite keen to know more about this, this topic, I encourage you to read a book by uh, a guy called Benjamin Graham, who is widely considered to be Warren Buffett's uh, mentor. He, he has a good section about differentiating between these two areas. So one thing you need to know, I think the first thing, before you buy any, any products out there, the first thing you need to do is to actually not understand the markets or financial products, but really understand yourself. What is it that you're looking out for? What is your risk-return profile? Remember, risk and return come hand in hand. 
The more returns you want, typically the more risk you have to, you have to take on. So these are some basic investor profiles, and I've extracted this courtesy of Bank of America. It ranges from a conservative investor profile, low risk, low return type of, type of scenario. You have moderate conservative sort of profile, you have moderate profile, moderate aggressive, and aggressive profile. Now why is it important to figure out which category you fit into? It's important to figure out which category you fit into because it, it helps you to narrow down what kind of investment products are suitable for you, what kind of asset allocation decisions you should be making. Say, for example, if you're a conservative investor, um, you could look more into your portfolio that's more skewed towards bonds, right? Because bonds are generally considered less risky instruments. If you're a more aggressive investor, you don't mind the volatility in markets, you like to take on risk. You have more stocks in your portfolio, single stocks. Maybe even some of you might play currencies. Maybe some of you might even go for uh, CFDs or other type of structured products. So that's something to, to take it off. Now, once you've decided what kind of investor you are, then it comes down to what kind of investment products suit your risk return profile. And these are some examples that I just shown out here. Bear in mind that this is not an exhaustive list. When you start to work, when you graduate, you start to work, you have friends who become bankers, they'll come to you and talk to you about hundreds of investment products out there that could be suitable for you. Now, the, the difference about this when you think about investment products is, well, think about the complexity, how easy or difficult it is to understand these products, how risky it is in terms of volatility of these products, and typically you have fixed deposits, you have bonds out there, and we have Singapore savings bonds, Singapore government security bonds, those are considered the least risky instruments within uh, this chart here. What's most risky out here, I would say, would be your contracts for difference, arguably your currencies and your structured products, where sometimes when you take on leverage, which is you're not really using capital to invest, you're using borrowings to actually invest, you can lose more than the initial amount that you put in, especially when you do margin trading. So once you've decided on the investment products uh, to take on, then next comes the process of deciding, do you want to do the investments yourself or do you want to outsource your decision making or your process to someone else, whether it's a banker or financial advisor or insurance agent? And it comes down to three, these three things here. Typically, if you do it yourself, it would be more time consuming because you could do more research, um, you've got to spend more time educating yourself, you've got to know how to work out the trading system, etc. You've got to compare different costs here and there. Um, so it comes a lot down to time and cost. Typically, doing it yourself, more time consuming, but it's the most cost effective, it's the least expensive option. If, however, you choose to work with, say, a third party person, a banker, uh, a financial advisor, then there's quite a few things that you need to ask yourself before you work with this person. So if you choose to do it yourself, do your own investments, here are just some examples that I've shown out in this slide here. There are so, with technology now, there's so many online trading platforms that you can look into to, 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 to trade. Um, UOB KHAN has an online trading portal. We have Philip Securities there as well, same thing. The other example I have there is Fund Supermart. Fund Supermart is an online mutual fund platform that allows you to buy and sell, sorry, buy mutual funds. Um, one thing to note though, when you look at all these platforms, is to look at the fees and, and the charges that are involved there. And it's useful to compare because from time to time, some of these platforms actually offer certain promotional rates that may, may be quite attractive. So those, so, so that's, sort of deciding between doing your own investments or doing it with other people. Now, I'd just like to cover a few very basic uh, investment concepts. And these are things, by the way, that apply to, you, to any investors, be it how experienced you are or how inexperienced you are. The first thing they like to cover is diversification. And the best way to say this is don't put all your eggs in one basket. Same thing with investments as well. Don't put all your money into a single penny stock. You're gonna get burnt, or you may get burnt. And that comes down to, again, investing versus speculation, right? Speculation may give you short-term gain, but it can give you long-term pain as well. We talk about this thing about efficient frontier. Those of you from finance background who have come across this theory before, what it tries to do is basically tell you that for a certain level of risk that you take on with regards to your investments, there is an efficient, there's an optimal return that you can try to achieve by having a variety of assets that you invest in as opposed to focusing on just one or two investments. That is how for a given amount of risk, you actually maximize the amount of returns that you can achieve in your investment portfolio. 
Now you can apply this concept to diversification to the next thing I want to talk about, which is how do you create yourself an investment portfolio? And this is just one method that you can do. So in the, in the investment management community, we talk about this quite often. We call it a core and satellite approach. Some people call it a strategic asset allocation, technical asset allocation. What we do really in this is to talk about, first of all, you, you define what are your core assets? What are your core investments? Core investments are typically those things which are more stable, less volatile, things which basically, investments which basically allow you to go to sleep at night without having to worry about it. You don't have to worry about things. These are your things that will hold you steady throughout your investment time horizon. Then you have things around that. That's why it's called satellite, around your core investments that are perhaps a little bit more exciting, have more upside potential. Um, I think I heard some people talk about FANG, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, you know, tech stocks, very, very exciting stuff. And maybe you want to have some exposure to that because you believe that you know, we are in the next sort of tech boom era. So you can have exposure to, to the tech sector by buying a tech ETF. But remember, this, is, this, is, this tech isn't sort of, I wouldn't consider it a core allocation. It's something which is more volatile and it's cyclical by nature, which means to say that as the economy is doing well, tech stocks tend to do well, but when we are in a, going to be in a downturn, watch out for that. So that, those are the things that you need to monitor a bit more. Same thing as well for REITs, sensitive to interest rate movements. So that's about core and satellite approach. The next thing I want to talk about is about this concept called the investment clock. And it's very simple. The investment clock just tries to tell you that across an economic cycle, which essentially there are four phases, expansion, slowdown, recession, and recovery, some asset classes will do better than others across this economic cycle. I don't have time to cover some of the points there, but uh, I think it's quite self-explanatory. The next slide here um, illustrates the point that I'm trying to make. And what this chart shows you is the best performing asset classes over the last 15 years, and which are the worst performing asset classes. And the key takeaway here is that the winners rotate. If you look at 2002, if you had invested in commodities, you would have made the, the most amount of gain in 2002, about 25%. But look at where commodities have been over the last couple of years in this deflationary environment that we have. It's been one of the worst performing asset classes. Same thing as well with REITs. At the back of QE1, QE2, QE3 in the US, you know, REITs have, have, have done really, really well. Uh, but again, don't forget that pre-crisis in 2007, they were the worst performing asset class. Same thing can be said for emerging market equities as well. So that's something to take note of. Again, don't put all your eggs in basket. Diversify your assets. The other thing to note is that from this is also don't try to time the market. Even as investment professionals ourselves, we never claim to be experts in what we do. The beauty about the investment community is that you can never predict where markets are. In fact, some people say that trying to time the market is trying to catch a falling knife. Have you heard that expression before? Trying to catch a falling knife, well, there's a 50-50 chance that you can catch it on the handle, which is fine, or you can catch it on the blade, which you end up hurting yourself. So that's market timing. I've just about run out of time here, uh, but I think I need to spend a, just a few minutes covering off this section here. Now, it's, in investing, it's equally important to understand you know, what's your potential upside, but also it's about understanding what are the risks out there. And here are just some questions to ask yourself if you're choosing to work with, say, a financial advisor or a banker. You've got to ask yourself the question, who are you buying for? Is this person licensed? Is the company that you're buying from licensed? Do they have a track record? How does the product that the, the person is trying to sell you, how does it work? Don't be shy to ask the person to describe to you. And the person cannot explain it to you in simple terms in five minutes, then I wouldn't advise you to go ahead with that particular investment. Ask yourself about the fees as well. What are the fees involved? What is the sales charge? Is there an ongoing recurring management fee? Is there a performance fee? Is there a redemption penalty fee as well? These are the things that you need to ask. And last but not least, ask yourself, how does it fit into your investment objective? Again, coming back to your risk return profile. You need to do your own due diligence um, before you buy any investment products. Some of the things that you can do on your own is to check out these two sources on the MAS website. There is a financial institutions directory, and there is also a investor alert list. And this basically shows you the companies that are regulated by the MS and companies which are not regulated by the, 
by the MS, which you might want to be mindful of. The other thing you can do is you can also check this thing out called the Register of Representatives. Now in Singapore, anyone who wants to provide financial advice or sell financial products needs to have a license. Even for myself, I have to do that as well. We have to pass a series of exams before we can take a license, and we have to be deemed sort of free and proper individuals. Now, what you can do is that from the person that you're buying from, if you really wanted to, you could actually check online whether or not he has that appropriate license or not. So those are some of the things uh, to note. There's the other thing that I thought of covering as well, which is product risk. In the case, so this is just an example of mutual funds. Every mutual fund in Singapore has to be accompanied by a fact sheet there. A couple of things that is mandatory to be shown on that. Again, fee structure, information about the fund, what are you actually investing in, look at the performance of the fund as well. Every fund has to be accompanied by a document called a prospectus and a simplified version of that called a product highlight sheet or in short PHS. And what a PHS does is it's an abbreviated version. It's actually very good uh, for investors. It tells you what are the pro what, who is this product suitable for and what are the risks associated with this product. I've come to the final slide of my presentation here. Um, it pays to do your homework because you don't want to fall uh, for scams out there. And here are just two examples that I'd like to highlight. The one on the left is investors crying foul over three investments gone wrong. I have you know, seldom heard of um, such exotic asset classes as three investments, but in this case, um, there was sort of a buyback scheme where a company promised investors if they were to put in a lump sum amount, they would get some form of dividends over the next couple of months. What happened then was that the company director left the company and the company closed down and investments, uh, investors' money, they could not get back their monies. Very similar story as well for the story on the right, which is gold scams. Uh, and again, it took place in the form of sort of a buyback scheme. So be careful of such things out there and always remember that sometimes when the returns sound like it's too good to be true, sometimes it probably is. So on that note, I thank you uh, for your time this evening. I hope that over the last 20 minutes or so, you found some of the stuff I said to be useful, and I wish you all the best in your investment journey ahead. Thank you, everyone.